afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm doing this live video because I had a dream last night and in the dream I was in church and I was preaching a sermon and I, I know that I'm being led by God to share this live this morning so um, I was preaching this sermon in my dream and when I woke up this morning everything that I had heard God say while I was preaching I could remember it practically word for word when I woke up this morning from the the, the title of the sermon what scripture it came from and the different things that I heard God saying while I was preaching so I got up this morning and I started to to write a post about it but it was like no it, the post would have been just too long for me to explain what was in the dream so um, I felt led to do a live so I'm gonna give you guys what God gave me and that's it but this is a message that God wants to get out that he wants people to to know that this is on the mind of God concerning mankind so to those of you that have an, an ear to hear what the Lord is saying lend God your ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying if it pertains to you then by all means you have been given you're still being given an opportunity to repent and do what it is that God is requiring you to do so the 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 topic of the sermon that I was preaching was called lose the weight to get through the gate I just kept hearing that over and over and over while I was preaching. I kept saying that over and over and over. Lose the weight to get through the gate. And the scripture that I'm going to be coming from is Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. And it says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it and while I was up there preaching it was like God was giving me an illustration that people are too fat to enter in through the gate he just kept talking about the straight and the narrow path the straight and the narrow path um, and the scripture tells us in the book of Matthew straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, unto eternal life. And few, and the Bible says, and few there be that find it. Few people find their way on this straight and narrow path because walking on the straight and narrow path and doing this thing the way that God wants us to do it, it requires you to give up a lot. It requires a sacrifice on your behalf. And the reason why few people find their way truly on the straight and narrow path is because they don't want to give up what it is that God wants them to give up in order for them to inherit eternal life. God has a way that he wants us to live. God has a standard. And only a few people value God enough or value a true relationship with God enough that they're willing to give up what it takes for them to, to, to give up to find themselves on this straight and narrow path. Because you still have a lot of people who are in the way, but they still, they're living how they want to live. They're living their life how they want to live it. They're living their life in such a way 
that their life does not glorify God. Their life does not exemplify God. They say that they belong to him, but they're doing everything that everybody else is doing that don't belong to God. So therefore, they give serving God a bad name. Or they, they lead by bad example, I'm going to say. And this is why God is saying few, few people find, find their, their, their selves in the way, in the path that leads to eternal life. And God says they're too fat. And he was like, they're too fat. And as he was saying this in the dream, he was showing me, it's like an illustration of a person that's like, you guys ever tried to squeeze in between a, a, a space that was too narrow for you to get in? And you like, oh my God, like, I'm too, I'm too big to be trying to get through this little old space. And God was saying the people are, they're too fat. They're too wide to fit through that small opening. That means that these are all of the things that people are carrying, that they're walking in, pe things that people are doing, ways that people don't want to give up in order to find their way on to this straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. And God says they're too fat off of sin, too fat off of pride, following our own way, following, fulfilling our own desires. So basically we're doing what, what we want to do. We're doing what we want to do. We're living how we want to live. We're doing things. And this is the thing God is saying. They know that these things, that these things don't, pl don't please me. They know that these things are against the way that I have asked people to live, but they still do them anyway because they want to. And he said, they still think that they're going to in inherit eternal life. I know this is God that sent this message. This I'm going, I'm going, I'm going on, I'm going through with it. He says, some of, some of you are too wide to fit through that small opening because you have too much going on. He said, you can't sneak in, nor can you force your way in. You have to lose the weight to get in. And I'm going to explain that part to you, lose the weight. There are some things that we're going to have to turn loose. We're going to have to let go. We're going to have to stop doing simply because we know that these things are not pleasing in the sight of God. And we keep doing them anyways. And we think that God is just going to just accept us. And that God is just going to, oh, well, that's just how they are. No, he said you need to lose the weight. You need to lose the weight. And then he says, there is not enough room for all of that on the straight and narrow path. There is not enough room for you to have all of this stuff going on, doing all of these things that you want to do and still expect to remain or to walk on the straight and narrow path. He says there's not enough room for all of that. But he said, but there is room for everything that you want to do on the broad path. Because it's two paths that the scripture talk about. It talks about the broad road that leads to destruction. And it talks about the straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. He led me to this scripture, Hebrews verse one. And it says, wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. This is the part that God really wants you to pay attention to. Let us lay aside and the sin which does so easily beset us. Get us off course, get us off track. Because Every weight is not a sin, but every sin is a weight. Every sin is a weight. Every weight is not a sin, but every sin is not a weight. I don't know if you guys missed that last part, but I'm going to read that scripture again because something came on my screen. And it is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside 
every weight and the sin which doeth so easily beset us. So God is saying, we can, we can do these things. We can lay aside these weights. We can cast off these weights that are, that are causing us to fall behind and not live up to our true potential in God. We can turn to loose these things in these people that we are, that, that, in these things that we are doing that's causing us not to walk in obedience to God. He's saying, he, he said in Hebrews chapter 12, lay aside every weight and the sin. So he's letting us know every weight is not a sin, but every sin is a weight. If you're living in sin, that is a weight. How easy do you think it would be for you to run or to walk or to perform effectively when you are weighted down? When you have weights, you know what I'm saying, attached to your legs and attached to your feet. You can't move that fast. And even if you are still moving, you will not arrive at the destination that you are to arrive at in an adequate amount of time because you are weighed down. You have all these weights on you. So he says, let aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And he says, let us run with patience this race that is set before us. There's another scripture in the Bible that says the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but unto those who endure to the end. Our faith has to endure to the end. We will be tested. We will be tried throughout this lifetime in this walk while we're, while we're walking with God, while we're living for Christ. We have a choice every single day if we're going to continue with God or if we're going to just say, you know what? you know this is not worth it and decide that we want to walk away the choice is ours god does not take away our right to choose we will always have our right to choose and there's another scripture in the bible that says choose ye this day who you're going to serve whether you're going to serve god or whether you're going to serve satan make that choice god is giving you the 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 option and the freedom to make that choice who are you going to serve god or satan it's your choice. It's up to you. I then heard the Lord saying, everybody crying, Lord, Lord, will not make it in. So when I looked that scripture up, I was kind of surprised to find that this is still in the same um, passage of scripture that I was originally reading. Matthew chapter 7. Now this is verse 21. He says, and God asked this question, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? That's also in, in the Bible as well. When you guys get a chance, you can either Google these scriptures or you can go look them up in your Bible. But all, this is all word. This is all scripture. It's all Bible. It's all God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 says, I'm sorry, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, judgment day, the end of time, the end of the world. Many people are going to stand before God and they're going to say, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And he says, I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity or your work was done in iniquity. This is talking about people who, um, who have, have done many things in the, in the name of the Lord. They, they're going to cast out demons. They're going to cast demonic spirits out of people. They're going to prophesy in God's name. God going to use them to prophesy, speak a true word. They're going to preach. And be effective in God's name. But God is saying behind closed doors, they was living in sin. They was weighted down. They was living in sin. They did all of these things in my name. Yes, you did. But he going to say, I don't know you. Depart from me. Get out of my presence. He's going to condemn them to hell because... Even though they were doing all these things in God's name and, and portraying themselves as true men and women of God, as people of God, they was calling on his name, speaking on his name. Everything came out of their mouth was 
God this, Jesus that, Lord this, the things of God. But their heart was not true where God was concerned. They were living, they were they were really living in sin and they were using God's righteousness in the things of God as a cloak, as a cover-up for the things that they were doing that were not pleasing in God's sight. And because of those things that they would not put in check and put in order, that they knew that they were doing that were not right and pleasing in the sight of God, he's going to say for that, I'm going to tell you to be removed from my presence. I don't know you and you, and you don't know me. So God, God had me to continue reading down um, the, the book of um, Matthew chapter 7. And he just had me to, to add the rest of these scriptures to what it is that I'm saying to y'all this afternoon on this live. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and I believe I'm going to read through verse 29. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, y'all. But small is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. What is God saying to us, people? I'm going to read that again. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. He says, he's telling us, he says, look, y'all, enter through the narrow gate. Come in through the narrow fence, through the narrow gate. Because he said, wide is the gate and broad is the road. It's a big, it's a wide road. It's a wide lane that people are traveling on that leads to destruction. When you, you full of sin and you weighted down with sin, the only place that you're going to find room to operate like that in is the raw, the broad road, the wide lane that leads to destruction. And he said, many people are going to enter into destruction on that rock, that wide path because you, you don't want to give it up for God. You don't want to lose the weight to gain God. You don't want to get skinny. You don't want your, your margin to be narrow because you want to do everything that you want to do. You want to live this life. I'm going to do what I want, when I want, with who I want. I'm just going to do what I want. And just completely disregard the fact of what it is that God is, is calling and requiring. And he said that road leads to destruction. And he said many people are on that road. Many people are going to find themselves on that road. And many people are going to enter into destruction. Living their lives on that road. And verse 14 he goes on to say. But small is the gate. And narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few and only a few that find it. He went from saying many going to enter on the, the broad road that leads to destruction. Because God know the heart of man. God know the mind of man. God know the will of man. God knows the spirit of man. God knows us better than we know ourselves. That's why he's saying, you know what? It's more of y'all that's going to not want me than it's going to want me. It's more of y'all that's going to want my stuff, but not going to want me. It's more of y'all that's going to rather fake like y'all know me than to actually put in the work. Than to actually hurt yourself by sacrificing and telling yourself, no, I can't do that. No, I shouldn't want that. No, I'm not going to do that because of how God feels about it. Because of what God says about it. He said, it's more of y'all that's going to that's gonna act like that than it is of people that are going to actually say, you know what? I love God. I got to do what the Lord say do. I got to do what's pleasing in the eyesight of God. I got to do this because this is how God feels about it. He says only a few people that's going to operate like that. And while I'm speaking, I hear the spirit of the Lord saying, many are called, 
but few are chosen. Many, 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 many. Think y'all meditate on this. Y'all meditate on this. Many are called, but only a few are chosen. Many are called, but a few are chosen. Many are gonna gonna live this life on the broad road that leads to destruction, and only a few people are gonna find themselves on that that very narrow path that leads to eternal life. Then, as in verse fifteen, it goes on to say, "Watch out for false prophets." This is the Bible talking. I ain't talking about nobody. I'm reading to y'all what the word of God says. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. This is God talking about fake people. People who really don't belong to him, but they saying that they do. They coming in God's name, but deep down inside, when you really get to know them, you be like, what? What? I've heard sinful people. Well, I'm not calling nobody sinful, but I've heard people who, who would say, I don't know God like that, or I don't really live for God like that. And they'll see somebody who says that they know God doing certain things, and they'll say, I thought y'all weren't supposed to do that. It's funny how a sinner or somebody who don't even know God like that can, can look at the life of one who says that they're a believer and one who says that they belong to God and say, I thought y'all weren't supposed to do that. God says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And God is making a distinction here. When you look at a sheep, we all know a sheep is a very humble animal. A, see, a sheep is a very gentle animal. It's a very quiet animal. And then God is comparing fake Christians to you'll know them by whether they are sheep-like or whether they are ferocious, like, like wild beasts, like wild animals. That cannot be tamed. That are not tamed. And that are untamable. Doing good deeds. Is not enough. To get you into heaven. Being a good person. Being a nice person. Is not enough. To get you on this. Straight and narrow path. That God is talking about. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. He says, do people, he said, can you go and pick grapes off of a thorn bush? Or can you go and get figs off of a thistle? A thistle is a type of bush. I believe it's a thorny bush. We all know if we touch something that's thorny or that's prickly it, it pricks us it hurts us it causes us to bleed when we touch it he say you don't go looking you go looking for grapes on a grapevine a grapevine produces grapes a fig tree produces fruits when you gotta go pick a grape you don't expect to get stuck you don't expect to get hurt you don't expect to get pricked you don't expect to bleed but God is saying, this is the nature of those who really don't belong to him. He said, they come to you in my name. He said, they got on sheets, clothing. It's a costume. It's a costume. Oh, God. Jesus. Is your professional God a costume? Is it a cover-up for, for who you really are? A, a wolf that put on a sheep costume to trick people into thinking that they're a man or woman of God and they really belong to God. But underneath that wool is some teeth that's ready to bite you. It's some claws that's ready to, to scratch. It's a mouth that's ready to devour you. It's something that's hard 
and, and sharp and ready to hurt you, ready to stick you, ready to stab you, ready to hurt you and cause you to bleed. This is what God is saying. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears good fruit. God wants us to open our eyes and look at things for what they really are and look at people for who they really are. Yes, the Bible says don't judge. We're not supposed to judge anybody because we don't have a heaven or hell to put anybody in. We don't have the right to condemn anybody to hell and we don't have the authority to place anybody in heaven. But God wants us to open our eyes and see things, see life, see people for who they really are. See ourselves for who we really are. Are we, are we measuring up and adding up to our profession and who we say that we are? Because he's saying a good tree don't bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. He says every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And God goes on to say, thus by their fruit, you will recognize them. He say, look at the fruit that's on the tree. That'll tell you what kind of tree it is. Look at the fruit that's on the tree. Can you walk up to that tree and extract from that tree something good, something that's sweet, something that's going to do you good, something that's wholesome, something that's nutritious, something that's going to nurture you, or is it going to be a bittersweet? You, you guys, I don't know if you guys know what a bittersweet is, but when I was a child growing up, there used to be fruit trees all in the neighborhood where I lived. And it was this one orange that was called a bittersweet. It, it was so nasty. It was so sour. It was so bitter. Like you could not enjoy that, that orange. It was disgusting. From a distance, when you see that, that tree, you be like, oh, an orange tree. Because as kids, we used to eat oranges, tangerines, ruby red grapefruits, regular grapefruits, tangelos, um, navel oranges. It was so many different fruit trees that used to grow in our neighborhood. And we was kids, we'd be running around the neighborhood playing. We'll go pick a couple oranges, eat us some oranges, and go get a water hose and, and drink some water. That's what that's how we ate. We ate off of the land. Since they have cut down all the trees, there are no more orange tree, trees and fruit trees in our in our neighborhood. Not like it used to be. Guavas, mangoes, all kind of fruit trees in, in our neighborhood. But as I'm talking, I see this. I see the vision of this bittersweet. And a bitter a, a, a tree, what bittersweet grew on, that's all that you could find on that tree. You could not go up to that tree and find a sweet ruby red grapefruit. You could not go up to that tree and find um a tangerine or a navel orange or a honey bell, those good sweet oranges that was good for you. They tasted good. And God saying here, he said, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And he says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. He says, identify people by their fruit. Let me tell you something. You can't say that you are in God and you don't want people inspecting your life. You can't say that you are in God and your response to every time somebody call you out on some bad fruit that they see on your tree, only God can judge me. Yes, you're right. Only God can judge you. But he right here, he's giving people the the uh he's giving people the freedom to inspect the fruit that's on your tree, especially if you say that you belong to him. And you can't get mad when people find something on your tree that's not supposed to be there. You can't get mad. You can't get upset. Because if you know that you are truly rooted and grounded in God and your roots run deep in God and you are you are not confused about what kind of tree you are or what kind of fruit is on your tree and you don't get mad when people say, hey, what's that I see on your tree? Why, why are you doing that and you say that you saved? Oh, only God can judge me. He's going to judge you. He's going to judge us. He is. He's going to judge us. And then he goes on in verse... That was verses 15 through 19 that I just read. I'm sorry, verse 20. 
verse 20 ended with, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Verse 21, he goes on to talk about true and false disciples. This is God speaking to us this morning. He says, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only to those, only to the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Verse 24 talks about the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock, which is Jesus which is the truth, which is the word of God. And he goes on to say, but everyone who hears these words of mine, everyone who hears my truth, everyone who hears my word, everyone who hears my preachers that I send, everyone who hears my scriptures, everyone who hears me speak by way of my spirit, And does not put them into practice, does not take heed, does not listen, does not obey, does not walk in obedience to my word, does not change, does not lose the weight, does not lay aside every weight that so easily besets them and keeps tripping them up and causing them to repeat the same sin cycles over and over and over and over and over again. Because they will not let people go. He says, and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. God said, you are a fool. You are fooling yourself. If you think that I could say, don't fornicate and you can live in a relationship with a man or a woman and continue to have sex and you're not married and think that you're going to continue to do that, and but you're going to inherit eternal life. He said, you're a fool. You're a fool if you can keep lying, if you can keep stealing, if you can keep doing these things that you know are not pleasing in my sight, that you know are in written in the word of God that you shall not do. He said, you're a fool if you think you can hear that and you can continue living like that and you're going to inherit eternal life. He says, you're not on the, you're not on the narrow way. You're, you're living your life in the broad way. You're on the wide path that leads to destruction. He said, if you think you can be married and keep committing adultery, cheating on your husband or your wife, if you think you can keep dishonoring your parents, mistreating people, mistreating your children, if you think you can keep laying up, having sex, cheating, sleeping with people's husbands and people's wives, being wicked, being evil, practicing all kind of wickedness and divisiveness as a way of life, and think that you too, you too fat. To fit on the narrow path. There's no room for all of that. On the narrow path. He said he wants you to know. You're on the broad path. That leads to destruction. You fat enough to do all that over there. It's big enough to, to carry the weight. Of all of that that you're doing. Over there. If you think. You can hear these words of mine. And not put them into practice. And not do them. He say, you, you just like a foolish man that built his house on the sand. On the sand, y'all. What kind of weight can sand carry? If you set anything that's too heavy on sand, it's going to sink. It's going to sink. That's not a sure foundation. That's not a solid foundation. You only fooling yourself. It's only going to be a matter of time. Before what you done built is going to crumble. It's not going to be there anymore because you did not build your house on the rock. You built it on sand because you kept building your life on the premise that, oh, I could do what I want to do and I'm still going to go to heaven. 
Who are you to judge me? You can't tell me what to do. Sand. That's another block to your house you didn't put on the dirt. Sand. But if you hear God's words that say, stop lying, stop cheating, stop stealing, stop doing this, stop fornicating, stop backbiting, stop doing this, stop doing that. You say, you know what? I'm going to stop. I'm, I heard you, God. That hit me. That hit me right that hit my nail. You landed on me, God. That word landed on me. That's where I'm at. That's what I'm doing right now. Oh, God, I'm going to stop because that's what you said. You want me to stop doing it. He said, you wise. God is calling you wise. He said, you a wise man because you heard. You began to practice them. When I was young, I used to hear them say, practice make perfect. Anything that you practice doing, you're going to perfect it, whether it's right or wrong. You're going to perfect it. If you practice, even if you fall, get back up and try it again. Okay, God, I failed you this morning, but I'm sorry. I want to do better. I need to do better, Lord. I recognize I need to do better because you're requiring more out of me. Help me, Lord. I want to do this because this is what you said is right. God calls you wise. He said, I don't care what happens. I don't care what you go through. He said, the winds are going to blow. The rain is going to fall. The floodwaters are going to come. Everything that's meant to destroy you, it's going to come. But if you build your house on this solid rock, on my word, he said, after all is said and done, when, when the gray clouds roll away, when the smoke clears, the house that you built, it's going to be still left standing. But for those of you who hear the words of God and, and, and continue to walk in ignorance and continue to walk in disobedience and continue to do what it is that you know God is speaking against, he said, keep right on building that house. Um, keep building it on sand. And he says, then the rain came down. And the streams rose, the flood waters came, and the winds blew, hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever, typhoons, you name it. Y'all know sometimes life gets so hard, it feels like you're going through a storm. You're like, my God, my God, can I just get my head above water? Can I just come up for air? Can I just get a break? I'm going through trial after trial after trial, storm after storm after storm. And God says the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. And it fell with a great crash. Everything that you do, that you build, if it's not built upon the solid rock of God, Jesus Christ in the word of God, it's not a matter of if it's gonna fall but when it's going to fall, because it's surely going to fall. It's surely going to fall. So I encourage y'all today that have heard this message. We all know where we are. We all know where we are. Yes, none of us are perfect, but we can strive for perfection. We can practice perfecting things in our lives that we know are, are not God. If you're are not like God, if you're not married. It's, that's a simple face. Get married. If if you are incontinent sexually and you cannot uh, refrain from, from having sex and you know that's not your husband or you know that's not your wife, get married. If you can live with them and do everything that married people are doing, because God said marriage is between a man and a woman. It is what it is. Those are his words. Women and women, men and men, men and women that are not married, uh, women and men that are not married, we not. The Bible speaks against it. Get married. If you a liar, practice telling the truth. You know when you finna tell a lie. You know when you done lied. Repent. Practice telling the truth the next time. If you a thief, stop stealing. Practice not stealing. Practice not picking up and walking away with something that does not rightfully belong to you. Begin to practice the opposite. And the more you practice it, it'll become a habit. Before you know it, you ain't even doing that no more. 
but you're building you're building that upon the truth of God which says don't do that that's what God wants us to do he wants us to begin to build and begin to build wisely anything that you've built up to this point that you did not build on the word and the truth of God tear it down yourself do yourself a favor and go ahead and tear it down you have God's permission to just go ahead and, and demolish your own house that you then built that was not built on the word of God. Go ahead and, and destroy it now before it gets destroyed for you. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The way that Jesus taught was liberating. It freed people up to do what was right. It, it, it freed them up spiritually. There are some people that are preaching and teaching and the spirit that they're preaching and teaching in, it comes to yoke people up, it comes to bind people up, and it comes to obligate people to their agenda and what it is that they want to accomplish. God wants you to know there is a difference in teachers and teaching. Everybody ain't preaching and teaching to free you up to the things of God. And they're even using the word of God. They're even using scriptures, but they're using it in a twisted kind of way to bind you up and yoke you up to get you to, to follow their demands, not to set you free to the things of God and what it is that God says you can have, you can be, and you can do. So verse 28 and verse 29, the, the people, how, why were the people so amazed at what Jesus had just told them when they had been hearing the word of God all along? What Jesus taught them opened their eyes and allowed them to see what was really going on and the freedom that they experienced in their spirit from listening to Jesus' teaching, let them know it was a difference between the other teachers that had been preaching and teaching the word of God to them. Why come Jesus teaching? What Jesus telling us is so much different than what, what they've been telling us. Because those teachers, they were enemies of Jesus Christ, even though they were preaching the word. It's the truth anyhow. What they were doing it was against God because they were binding people up and yoking people up and Jesus was setting them free. Because you have people, th those religious teachers of that day, they were preaching because they had their own agenda. They hated Jesus and they were angry at him because he was taking the power and the influence and the notoriety away from them. People were starting to see them for who they really were, which were false teachers. And they began to follow after Jesus and, and, and follow Jesus' teachings. And that made the teachers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the religious leaders of that day very, very angry because they were religious. That's all they were. They weren't spiritual. Jesus was spiritual. They were religious. And they had an agenda. They needed to dominate the people. They needed to have control over the people. And they abused their positions, they abused their power, and they, they manipulated the people, the weaknesses of the people. And when Jesus came, Jesus came to set the people free with the teachings that he was giving them. I have one more thing, one more last note that's left at the end of, the, of this, this, this lesson that God had me to write down. And he said... The five foolish thought they had time. The five foolish thought they had time. There's a parable. I can't remember what book it is. I know it's in the Gospels. But it talks about the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. And how the five wise virgins, they were smart. Not only did they have oil in their lamps, but they had oil in a vessel. 
It was five fools and five five foolish and five wise. The five foolish virgins, they only had oil in their lamps. They didn't they didn't bring any extra oil with them. They didn't bring any oil in their vessels. So the the Bible says while the bridegroom tarry, which means he didn't come when they expected him to come. They were waiting for him to come, but because he took so long to come. I need y'all to hear what I'm saying. Everybody fell asleep. The five wives, virgins, they fell asleep. The five foolish fell asleep. And when they awoke, they heard the, they heard the alarm. They heard the, the warning sounded off. Everybody jumped up. And the five foolish realized oh, our lamps then burnt out oh man I ain't have enough oil I didn't build my house on a rock oh my god I didn't turn around when I had the chance to turn around let me get some of your oil this is what they say to, to the five wives Give me some of your oil. Give me some of your. I see you got more than enough. You got some in your lamp, and you got some in in the. Give me, just give me a little bit. No. Now is the time for all of us to get what we need for ourselves. You need to get yours. I need to get mine. It's not a selfish statement. It's a wise statement. It is in all of our best interest to make sure. That right about now, not only now, it's been time. We need to make sure that what we have built is built on a solid foundation. Because after all is said and done, after we done fell asleep and woke up again, and Christ is ready to return, is what you're going to have left, is it still going to be standing on a rock? Or is it going to be like the foolish that built it on the sand and then or the foolish that didn't get enough um, oil in their vessels and their lamp. Oh, God. And, and the, the five wives told them, uh-uh, go buy you some. Go in the city and go get you some oil from them that's selling oil. And the Bible says they went to go buy oil. And when they went to go buy oil, the groom came. And he took the five that was ready. He took back with him the five that was ready. And the other five foolish ones, they was gone. They was gone to go re-up. They was gone to go try to get it together. Oh, now let me hurry up and scramble and try to get it together. But it was too late, y'all. When they got back, the door had been closed shut and it was locked. Ooh, Jesus. Some of us going to get caught. And you know what? People, I've heard people say, oh, when the end of the world come, when Christ cracked the sky, I'm just going to look up and say, oh, God, forgive me of my sins. And boom, it's just going to be over just like that. And I'm going to make it in. No, baby. The door going to be closed already. It, it ain't going to be no more um, access granted. The door is going to be locked. When you, as soon as you look up, oh, that go Jesus. Oh, God, please forgive me. Guess what? The door is locked. God ain't no fool. We can't outsmart him. We can't outslick him. He steady sending word after word after word after word. Message after message after message after message. This ain't for nobody. This is for everybody. All of us need to self-examine ourselves. We need to check our own self right now, including me. I can be disqualified at the end. After people that got saved, people that changed and took heed, but me myself didn't get my own sin, sin life in check, my own sin, whatever, sins in check. I can be disqualified. I ain't pointing no fingers at you. I ain't pointing no fingers at nobody. Everybody take a self-evaluation. Are you, are you wise? Are you building on the rock? Are you building 
on the solid foundation? Or are you just not, are you going to leave away from this live with the same attitude, the same mindset, rolling your eyes at me, talking, speaking down on me, letting the devil speak who she thinks she is? Are you going to leave away from this live the same way that you came on it? And continue to go about your day, living your life the way that you've been living it? Or are you going to go on a diet? Are you going to go on a spiritual detox to rid yourself of anything and anybody, whoever, that you need to loose to get some of that weight off of you so that you can serve God the way that God wants to be served? Or are you going to be like the five foolish and say, I got time. I'm just going to go right down the street. I'ma just, I'ma just wait. I ain't ready yet. I'ma wait a little longer. I'ma wait till my, my 20. I'ma wait till I'm 25. I'm 18 right now. I'm 21 right now. I'ma wait till I'm an old lady. I ain't done living yet. And he might trying to call your number before you get back with that oil. Or he call your number before you start building on, before you even consider building on that rock and then you get back and you realize where everybody at? They done left you because because you were careless and unconcerned about the condition of your soul I know this was God, y'all. I know this touched somebody. I know this pricked somebody. Let us take heed. Let us take heed to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us, to you, me, us, in this hour, in this season of our lives. He or she that hath an ear, let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church in this day, this hour, and this season. I love y'all. God bless y'all. Until the next time.